Can you hear me? Okay. Um, sorry I'm late. I don't know how I kept a job. I'm not kidding. Um, <laughs> for that many years especially. Um, I'm so happy to be here and um, especially uh, to celebrate this new book that's so beautiful as all Larkspur uh, books are. Um, so I'd like to read a couple of poems from it. Um, the very first one, oh, let me tell you the concept because it's a little strange. Um, I was walking daily on a, a path in uh, Anchorage, Kentucky that um, the um, pizza magnet John Schnatter had built for um, the public. And it's a very beautiful um, walk. And so I did it for about five years, almost daily. And um, I paid a lot of attention to what I was seeing um, and um, started writing poems based on uh, what I was seeing and thinking at the time I was walking. And then I just thought, well, I'll try to do this once a month, and it'll take me about a year to write this book. Well, my rule was you can't write a poem about a month unless it's in that month. And so it took five years to write the book. <laughs> so <laughs> I wasn't in a big hurry, obviously. <laughs> um, so this is the very first one I wrote. Uh, this book goes from November to November. November. Tomorrow will be clear, 69 degrees, and I'll take a walk through the woods, across the bridge over Owl Creek, along Willow Lake, clean after days of rain, past the giant pumpkins too soft to carry composting the garden now for next year's squashes and the sad sunflowers, the gray considerate soybeans, home to quail and busy goldfinches. See the prairie of dry Susans, tall blue stem, ironweed, white Johnson grass, the nests, airy mistletoe, ornaments in the branches of the black walnuts. I want to sleep finally with nothing on my mind except the yellow cardigan in the bottom drawer I'll wear tomorrow because that's usually all you need when November pretends it's summer, when white iris sleeps beside red chimneys, beside spent lilies, beside dark hydrangeas, arms of Russian sage. I might look pretty good from a distance, Happy, backlit, happier even than the weather suggests I should be. I plan to take a walk tomorrow. Come with me. So um, I guess I take you on my walk over about a five-year period of time. Um, I thought that I would read... Um, I thought I'd read to you... Um, the poem, let's see. I think I'll read September, and then if I have time, I'll read um, November. Uh, but uh, probably one more poem, you think? Yeah, you're good. Okay, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is September. This summer has been hot, humid. A heat wave began in May, and until today blistered our souls if we walked barefoot. But here on the trail at 7 a.m., purple loose strife sways in the milder air, befitting the promise of fall, finally. For the first time, I've been recording numbers and names. I know how to look closely, to record everything I see. So I've turned to counting buds and petals, the veins of leaves, the inches in diameter of the oldest words. For a month now, I've been observing morning glories, white and blue-hearted, grow beneath a wood fence, smaller and smaller, I've watched tiny daisies as if out of gas, 
fuss with clover, agon goldenrod. Someone has let the plants go, but that's okay. It doesn't take a gardener to manage weeds and wildflowers. Nothing fixes some things or changes them, so I'm counting my sins, erasing our faults. It's my way of apologizing, turning to common sense, the bowl of infinite grace. Last night, five deer walked, single file inside you. A copperhead, two wrist bones in diameter, hung from a tree to scare you. Six laughing grasshoppers tried to wake me. You'd appreciate this. Six laughing grasshoppers tried to wake me. So, <laughs> my strange dreams that I have. And um, the last one, um, through this journey, which really was a journey, um, a lot of things happened in this period of time, um, including the death of my sister. So. Um, You'll see that, uh, I think, in this last poem. I haven't ever read this in public, so this will be interesting. November. At dusk, I decide to set out, expecting, once night falls, to walk in the dark, trusting the familiarity of the path to assist me. I may see headlights at the trail's furthest loop through the trees on the road to the hospital or a light in a kitchen window, someone eating a late supper in a house across the lake. Where at August, cicadas would be calling one another, soybeans mumbling as they darken. April would bring out raccoons, possums, skunks, scratching for whatever food the woods and pastures offer. But November is speechless. I move as in my house at night from memory. Neither bridge sound as the steel and concrete they're made of, creek beneath one, dry grass beneath the other, says anything to warn or stop me. We're used to each other, though usually when I cross them, I'm returning rather than setting out. The obvious danger is not what's present, but what's invisible. In daylight, a snake lay like a stick in the sun on the path before me. I nearly tripped one morning on a snapping turtle. Another time, walkers warned each other, watch for a large buck because it had charged a runner. We'd seen rubbings on small trees near the rope swing, deer feeding in empty bean fields, never bucks sparring nor chasing does until then. What I'm afraid of is I may wait too long. Others I love fear heights, rattlers, the brown recluse. Over and over I'm asked, what are you afraid of? At first I know the answer, but then what wasn't fear grows into fear. I suppose by now each orb weaver has laid her eggs, swaddled them in an elaborate web. When I walk out the front door home late, then down the stone path beneath the red maple to the mailbox, or hike in the mountains, say, up Death Canyon, drive rural roads in the middle of the night, even take this trail in summer. Before reaching the parking lot, webs swing like hammocks between branches to catch me. I wonder why I've yet to mention in any of these poems the outhouse west of the abandoned pumpkin patch. In summer of the fifth year, when it seemed no one was minding the trail, its weeds tall as boys, kids broke in and left the door open. A white porcelain toilet surprised me. <laughs> At the lake, the mute swan has decided to stay the winter. I can barely make out one of the hewn stone benches now. I would rest if my sister were with me. We could veer off the beaten path, feel our way to the amphitheater, sit a while. Should there be even a crescent moon later or stars, I'd fear less, move more quickly, talking myself, more or less intact, 
home. Thank you. I think the math is wrong. I think I'm up to 37 books. I'll change it. Well, the internet is not always to be trusted. I'm going to read a, s a small amount from three books, my three most recent books. Um, the first one is a book called Anecdotage, Everyday Epiphanies, is the subtitle. And uh, I don't know what to call it. It's, it's not really a straight memoir, because I think of memoirs as sort of very much like me, 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 and I, I don't think this is. Uh, the first is sort of in two parts, beyond the usual meanings. The polymath Renaissance man Victor Hammer composed, and that's in italic, his last book, Fragments for C.R.H., which is his wife, published an edition of 125 copies in 1967, the year he died. The word composed here has several meanings. He set the metal type for this book by hand, letter by letter in a compositor's stick, the usual method for setting type before the end of the 19th century. The types used for the book were of Victor's design types that originally came from matrices and punches that he had cut by hand. The other medium composed, Victor was the author of this book, and he was composing this book in the stick. There was no original manuscript from which he set the book. As he wrote it in his head, he set the metal type letter by letter. I'm not sure I've ever heard of or seen anybody do that before. In fact, I remember once at dinner at the Hammer's house, he called in to us to check the spelling of something as he was uh, setting the letters in a compositor's stick. The other is a, a, about uh, our grandchildren reading. Our first pair of grandchildren, Reldy and Eli, were visiting us while they were both avidly reading the first of the Henry Potter books, reading it at the same time. But not, as you might imagine, taking turns with the same copy of the book or having two copies, or reading it together, one over the shoulder of the other. Instead, they were at different places in the same book. Reldy reading the, her pages, sitting on the couch, and Eli on the floor, holding the book open near the end, both reading their different pages at the same time. <laughs> and this is... I thought of reading this for Gray and everybody else who set type by hand. A little dangerous knowledge. When Sid, Sid Corman started producing his magazine, Origin, in Japan, after moving to Kyoto, he noticed the typesetters were very careful and made very few mistakes. Then, after they started to learn English, Laxity replaced their former diligence, and typos began to sprout throughout the magazine's pages. And then the last selection from Anecdotage, Playing Favorites. I once gave a reading at a small community college. Afterwards, a student came to interview me for the student newspaper. Instead of asking me about my favorite poem, as is often the case, 
He asked me which poem of my own was my favorite. I could not relate to this question and told him it was impossible for me to choose a favorite child. Stumped, he looked down again at his spare notes and after some hesitation queried, well, then what is the second most favorite poem of yours that you've written? <laughs> This year, uh, I have a commonplace book called Gist, Orts, and Shards, and the third version of this was just published. So it's a, it's a quote book. My computer does, doesn't like the word orts because it doesn't know it. Orts, uh, if you go to a very fancy restaurant and they come to uh, take the bread, breadcrumbs off before dessert, that's what orts are, the breadcrumbs. <laughs> um, so it's just quotes that I've liked through the years. This is a quote from W.H. Auden, sort of about local writers. A poet's hope to be like some valley cheese, local but prized everywhere. And this is about Thoreau, by a very good book on Thoreau by Richard, Robert Richardson. It continued to be true of Thoreau, as Augustine said of Vero, that he read so much that it was a marvel he ever had time to write anything, and wrote so much that it was difficult to see how he found time to read. Soren Kierkegaard. Life can only be understood backwards. It can only be lived forward. In the back section of the book is a book, uh, is called uh, A Book of Correspondences, where I put at least two and sometimes many more um, things together that uh, play off one another. So this is two quotes. The first is Thomas Merton. One cannot begin to face the real difficulties of the life of prayer and meditation unless one is perfectly content to be a beginner and really experience himself as one who knows little or nothing and has a desperate need to learn the bare rudiments. Those who think they know from the beginning will never, in fact, come to know anything. We do not want to be beginners, but let us be convinced of the fact that we will never be anything else but beginners all our life. And then this is... Uh, a quote by Shunro Suzuki, his most famous book. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the experts, there are few. And this is the first one is uh, by Tommy Sands, who is an Irish folk singer. The ones who give the orders are not the ones who die. And then this is a poem by Bertolt Brecht. When leaders praise peace, the common folk know war is coming. When our leaders curse war, the orders to mobilize have already been written. And then this is the last pairing. 
a famous quote from Yeats from the second coming. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And then Cynthia Ozick. The victories over mass murder and mass delusion, West and East, are hardly permanent. Never again is a pointless slogan. Old atrocities are model, models. They give permission for new ones. The worst reproduces itself. The best is singular. Apply that to the neo-Nazis in our midst. I'll read just a few poems, and this is from my new book called Afloat, Poems 2014 to 2017. I'll start with a real small one. In the pumpkin patch, the toddler used to getting his way picks out a pumpkin he can't lift. Real wealth, enough firewood for three winters, trails in the deep woods, coming upon morals, the serendipity of finding an owl sitting silent up in a tree, the right book placed in your hand just when you need it, Love given and given, any playback, pure lanyap. The lovely exhaustion after lovemaking. An internal solitary space to visit whenever needed. Against speed. To be anywhere, you have to speed down and walk slowly. To know intimately just your small plot of earth that was given to you by luck and divine chance. Driving by so many racing beyond the speed limit. You learn nothing except life has passed you by. And then I'll finish with this one. When the world goes mad, wake up, earth is knocking us about. Hurricanes, earthquakes, while we make plans, it makes alternative plans. We still play deaf. Our petty greed, our petty calendars, we know what we want, what we plan to do next. Don't be impolite, don't interrupt. Our agendas versus dystopian nightmares. But humanity also shows its face. Instead of our small hatreds, people still go out and rescue others, often strangers. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out on this frosty morning. Um, I'm going to read a few from my most recent rumors of light, and maybe one from my new collection I'm working on. Uh, I thought I'd read this one because when we were driving over here this morning, I noticed frost flowers and 
I always think winter's here when I see them. Uh, this one's called Pondering the Nobel 2011. It's a sonnet. At school, back in that last millennium, she passed, by luck and a low curve, what some quite meanly called football physics. Now, her poet brain struggles to wrap around a rapidly expanding universe. Expanding into what? She loves the chatter of dark energy, a sort of shade that blurs the line between physics and the meta variety. In the long nights of crisp solstice air, planets pulse so close she, wear, she swears she could slip Venus between her lips, lollipop of light. Sunrise, frost flowers bloom in tangled stubble, catch the dawn like spun glass roses on a field of stars. I happen to have, and some of them are out there, a really stunning group of women friends. Um, and I wrote this poem to honor them. It's called The Grandmothers, but many of them aren't grandmothers, but they're all amazing. The Grandmothers. Years like ropes of bright beads, 60, 70, more, have whittled them into fine gray beauties who drape rainbow-hued scarves, slip in arty earrings, tug on boots of polished leather, rich suede, favor deep, clear colors and good fabrics that crisp from a hot iron breathe, caress soft flesh, juggle laughter and loss throughout long lives, keep some girlishness safe in a hidden pocket. Uh, the Sandhill Cranes. I used to spend a few weeks every summer in Northern Ontario, and then my parents retired to Florida, so this is sort of a migratory poem. The Sandhill Cranes. High summer, northern Ontario. Granite domes, cows and cranes in grass. Dawn breaks early. Huge birds skim the pastures, rattle carous to their young. November piles snow clouds in Kentucky skies, frosts the purple aster. Cranes track the river in a wavy V, long-necked arrows to the south. Sweater weather comes to the Gulf Coast. Old John plays golf on Christmas Eve. They wade the water hazard in scarlet caps, gray-feathered elves on stilts. Morning, December. Tatters of pink mist catch in the water trees. Slim black branches trail webs of cotton candy. Castles of fog billow above river and creek, rise in air like steam from a warm blue Cedars etch their bristles onto the rising sun. Fine bones of sycamore emerge from cloud. Um, I'm sure that you've all had stars named after you and other likewise uh, interesting Christmas presents. <laughs> so this one's called My Chickens. And it's for uh, Callie, my daughter, who loved to gather eggs.
Somewhere in this world, I have some chickens. They squawk and scratch in dirt, shape grass and bugs into shell and golden yolk, into chick and hen and foppish rooster. My friend Teresa gave me some chicks in memory of my other friend, Jean, who suggested we might help to feed people. So my flock of chickens is growing up under a fierce sun, dropping feathers in sand or loam or jungle verge, savanna, veldt, or high desert. Barefoot children chase my chickens, laugh at the light running along bronze feathers. A little boy slips his hand under each solid breast, feels the sure heartbeat, pulls out one warm ovoid miracle after another. I guess maybe there's a woman in a cotton dress who twists off the head of one of my roosters, plucks him and punches him into a stew pot and calls the neighbors for a Friday night feast. A toothless grandma cracks open a thigh bone and sucks out the marrow, stacks the bones in a neat pyramid. One of my hens hoards her eggs, plumps her body around the lumpy nest, breathes under sun and star, heat and driving rain, brooding. I'm working on a, a new collection of poems in the manner of Neruda's uh, essential odes. They're really long, skinny poems, and they're about one topic. This one's called Wood Stove. Iron stove, squat, square, ticks like a metronome. Dampers wink fierce red eyes. Green wood oozes juice, spits, cracks like birdshot. Boxy black god, it radiates heat in an airy whirlpool, white hot coal at the vortex. Behind the stove, wooden pegs sprout mittens, long johns, damp wool socks. Bread rises on a cloud of yeast, soup bubbles garlic into the mix. In a day of bad work, bungled opportunities, this I do well. Shovel out the ash, rake forward a shimmering heap of coals. Worms of hot light curl their elemental bodies. I open the big towel to the box of blue fire. Offer breasts, buttocks, calves, steam wreaths, wet curls. Droplets dance like hissing fairies. Of all the elements, we stand by fire. The tribe goes into the long dark. I jo join hands with those who crowd the hearth, generations of warmth seekers. And the last one I'm gonna read is called To the Unborn Girl Child. This one's also for Callie, but I didn't want to. The book's also dedicated to her, so I didn't want to burden everybody. <laughs> to the unborn girl child. Your luck is a carbon sunset with flawless copper edge. Your soul has opposable thumbs, your body a fine and formidable Freemasonry. This place has charming views, plenty of water, and mushrooms if you like them. We have bird calls, whale song, hollow knocking of bamboo, artifice of wood and string, a glory mix of blood and lungs, singing. There are men here. They have lovely bodies with kettle drum hearts, similar to your own. Tongues that ripen like persimmon, belly fires at which it is sometimes possible to shelter. The women have bright hair like trailing beards of stone crop. Painted and scented, they wear thoughtful eyes in bodies of incomparable roundness. Theirs are the bird voices, 
their blood will be familiar. <clears throat> Weaponry and art spring from the same rich compost, gold beaten into shapes of piercing beauty or bricked and hoarded deep underground. We have feasting and close laughter, dark corners where sorrow waits, rocky hillsides ankle deep in time. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read just a few poems from my first book, Render, and um, what you need to know to enter the poems is that it's a kind of story, and there are two characters. Um, the first is a guy who's woken up um, in a farm uh, not unlike my grandparents' subsistence farm, uh, not knowing how to survive there. And the second is the narrator, and she's um, kind of a trickster. She's sometimes giving him advice that helps him and sometimes giving him advice that will require him to learn the hard way. Um, the other thing that I should say about it is uh, it has a little epigraph um, from Audrey and Rich, and uh, it reads, without tenderness, we are in hell. And uh, when I was working on the book, that was the question in my head. Um, when are we without tenderness and why? How to wake. Learn your lesson from the calf. Look how he rams his head into the cow's sack when she does not drop, when she holds her drink like a warm secret let her know your thirst is there, a wide mouth bucket on the ground. If you want first milk, first light, sweet cream, first chore done, be mean. Shout her name, force her leg back, her tail swatting you, your fist pounding her, your face strained against the spate of flies, her hot dirt body, horns rising, open bone eroded by air and age. Do not be ashamed of this, your private pleasure. Take charge, tell her your secrets, your lips low against her utter like you are dream twitching, and who is there to see you? No one, no one. Watch yourself, you'll get shit on or kicked in the head. How to kill a rooster. Because he spurred you, grab him by his neck and his legs. Hold him in both your hands, look him in the eye. Let him ask if you were to kill him today. Then tell him yes, say yes with your own eye just before you take him to the clothesline and tie him up by his yellow feet. Take a blade, cut his throat, watch his blood drip to the ground, watch his wings spread and flap and flap. And while you watch this desperate bird and think to yourself, I will never be like him. Remember, in the end, you will drop him in boiling water. Pluck each of his oily feathers between your fingers. Remember, in the end, you will taste him for good. How to kill a hen. It's an equal opportunity. Enter the night coop with slink. Through your teeth sink. In this awful world of sorrow. Sing. In this wicked path of sin. 
tuck her under your arm and walk away from the laying birds, the cuckold morning rising in their dumb wings. Walk away from sleep. Make sure her hollow bones alone will be warmed by it, your wordless bellows breast. For this is your gift to her. Tell her you never think of tomorrow. Tell her or what you'd lose in the end. Enter the night coop whistling. Leave whistling. Climb the dust hill. When you get up to the house, ring once the orbit of your failing over your head, a breaking neck. For this is your gift to her. You can hear your savior calling, barefaced and feather red. So as the story continues, um, what I learned is that it's the animals among us who remember what tenderness is. How to build trust. See how she rakes against the fence, the other pigs, her straw, how she's tried. She really has. And what a simple thing for you to stop stacking hay, hosing away her filth, stop, what, maybe to smoke, your hands already out of your pockets, your teeth already clenched. What a simple thing, her head wrenching toward light, your fingers thick with her wire hair as you think about the work ahead, its musk and hazard, how this is not about love. As she comes to you, her whole muzzle inside your coat, her breath probing your chest, how she roots you, the yellow sky smoldering, how she asks for more. How to be a man. Don't miss. Shoot her square. If you squeal her, you can't shoot again. There are rules. You'll be made to chase her. And she will run in black dawn air, cold and clean. And you will run. And you will hear her screaming, the other hogs screaming, the other men jeering at you, less than them. And you'll be made to catch her, but you won't. And you'll be made to take her 400, 600 pound body to the ground, pin her, bleed her throat, but you won't. The black dawn air cold and mean, the wet fog your breath, or is it hers? And I'll close with this last murderous poem. <laughs> How to Kill a Hog. Do you remember how close you were to her when she was farrowing and she needed you, her bawling drawing you out of bed, a bad dream? How you washed her vulva, soft, warm water over your own hands, how you scrubbed even your fingernails under your fingernails before you came to the pen and the sunflower oil you coated yourself in so she would not chafe even as she hemorrhaged and how against all this bloody shit and hay you took each 
piglet out of her night and into yours, into your palm and cleared its mouth, its nose of mucus, how you brought breath to each set of tiny lungs, how you washed, how you opened her. This is how to touch her now. Once she is hung and cut, straight cut from rectum to neck, while the other men take their cigarettes, find quick coffee, food, lag behind, wait until the barn is empty, until you are alone. Then step inside her, your arms inside her death like it is a room, your private room, peculiar and clean, Gather her organs up into your arms like you once did your mother's robes when you were a boy who knew nothing but the scent of sweat and silk. Hold her and inhale before reaching all the way around to snip the last tendon before you cut the stomach, intestines, kidney, liver, before you cut her heart out and she drops into you and drops down into the cold washtub of the this day, close your eyes just once, just once. Do not turn away. Thank you. It's just an honor to be here. Uh, I'm going to read three poems from this wonderful book, <laughs> No Fool, No Fun. I have a real in with the editor there at Larkspur <laughs> Press. <clears throat> what we are thankful for and why. We're thankful the guy who threw the tire in our creek didn't throw the other three. <laughs> and that Walmart has not made us a target that the price of gas has given more reason to conserve. We're thankful the religious right has not completely destroyed Jesus' good name, <laughs> and that more are becoming aware and alarmed about mining practices that threaten our health. We're thankful because this is a thankful season. It's good to look up from our lives and see the world as joy. <clears throat> Why I like the new road. I'm glad all the red buds and dogwoods were cut down. <laughs> they were too distracting in the spring. <laughs> By straightening the road, we don't have to slow down to see the wildflowers. By filling the hollers, we can still go when it snows. I'm saving five minutes a trip. Now that this vein has opened, a new speedway has been built at the northern edge of our county. This will give a boost to the fast food and gas places. It's good for the county. I get tired of knowing everyone when I go to the grocery. <laughs> I like being anonymous. Maybe we'll get a Walmart. <laughs> Moving firewood in March. At 58, step down to a smaller wheelbarrow. Surprised at the ease 
more gets done. Contemplating this at the end of the day, beside a small fire of fallen branches, hear, then see, geese flying north, their V changing as another takes the lead. Through this life, we too adjust to the load. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this shirt says, I'm not perfect. You might have guessed that, but I'll admit it now. I'm not perfect, but I have a freaking awesome Belgian wife. And that's close enough, it says at the bottom, and it is close enough. <laughs> uh, she makes me wear this. But <laughs> she's, my wife Hilda is not here today, but uh, nonetheless, this story I'm about to read is a kind of a little tribute to her. It's called, How's That Again? As in, say what? All right. And it has a dateline, Lexington, April 2003. And you might remember that there was a, in the uh, spring of 2003, there was a gigantic ice storm in Lexington, which figures in this. Lexington, April 2003. Recently, say for about the last decade, or roughly 80% of our married life, the madam has been on my case about having my hearing tested, usually just after I've been on hers about her unfortunate habit of mumbling. He, heedless to my admonishments, she just, rumbles on, she just mumbles on and on. When it comes to listening to reason, the woman's as deaf as a hammer. But one fine day last fall, I had an experience that gave me pause. It started that morning when the UPS Brownie, get it, Brownie, delivered, to my delight, the swank new $189.95 coat suede jacket I'd ordered from the rugged, rugged fogey of the Old West catalog. The fit was just right. And for a while, I strutted about the house, quite pleased with my new goat suede outer man, imagining I favored that TV lawyer, Jerry Spence, with his fringed buckskins and flowing white locks, until I caught a glimpse of myself in a mirror and recognized not Jerry Spence, but Gabby Hayes. <laughs> Eventually, the madam mumbled, better make that muttered grimly, that she'd seen enough non-productive preening and sent me off to run some errands. So I'm tooling about town on this nice autumn afternoon my nice, in my little Kentucky, Kentucky Wildcat Blue 96 Toyota RAV4. For reasons I'll explain momentarily, his name is Cleve. Running my errands and tolerantly allowing the odious Rush Limbaugh to shout at me at the top of his odious lungs, I've noticed lately that if I don't turn the volume up, Rush has a tendency to mumble. <laughs> when it occurred to me that Cleve's own outer vehicle was looking pretty scruffy and needed attention, would Jerry Spence gad about in muddy rolling stock? Time to spruce up. Giddy up, Cleve! Now while we're toddling out Winchester Road to the car wash, let me seize the opportunity to make it clear that I don't generally hold much for the sentimentalizing or anthropomorphizing of vehicles, no matter how endearingly or infuriatingly sentient they sometimes seem. The practice does have literary antecedents, Gurney Norman's urge, Ken Kesey's further, my own, VW, my own late VW microbus, the McClanavan, and her asthmatic old traveling companion, Moldy Dick. But in, <laughs> but in the end, assigning one's motorized conveyance an affectionate nickname, Old Bessie, or Peaches, or Buck Fuddy, 
is a, <laughs> is a risky proposition at best, considering that, like Shakespeare's thankless child with a serpent's tooth, sooner or later the beast will surely turn on you or fail you in some time of need or crisis and reduce you to kicking its tires in rage and frustration. No way to treat a member of the family. Anyhow, at about the time of the adventure from which we're presently digressing, Cleve had no nickname at all, despite the fact that he'd been my good and faithful servant for the past six years and had just last summer borne me all the way to Oregon and back without a whimper. Nonetheless, although it was my devout hope that my Rev 4 and I held lifetime warranties on each other, Cleve didn't acquire a name of his own until, sadly, the recent ice storm that was the crashing grand finale of this dismal winter when a tree fell on him and clove his little blue noggin right down the middle, hence Cleve. <laughs> <coughs> As of, as of this writing, Cleve's on life support at the body shop, and it's a toss-up whether he's going to make it or be totaled. Stay tuned on that. Meanwhile, back to our story. At the new Winchester Road automated drive through car wash, I'm discovering that the word automated is more nuanced than I'd supposed, and the term drive through a downright misnomer. For starters, the automated cashier rejects my money, treats me like a goddamn counterfeiter if you want to know. <laughs> but then what or who turns up but, of all things, a human being? There's an attendant, it seems, a pleasant young man who takes my dough and gives me change and directs me to pull forward into a sort of bay where he personally applies a soothing balm of soapy pre-wash to my Rev 4's grubby, grubby exterior, while I resume my argument with Rush. The prepping accomplished, the pleasant young man motions for me to ease my front wheels onto the trolley track affair, which is to guide me into the maelstrom of great whirling, swirling brushes and cascading waters just ahead. And right there is where the drive through ends and the drag through begins. <laughs> Suddenly, with a heavy metallic clunk, some unseen mechanism reaches up from the hellish car wash underworld and grabs Cleve to be by the short hairs and unceremoniously yanks us toward the roaring car wash Niagara, even as I realize that the pleasant young man is now to my immediate left at the driver's side window, gesturing excitedly and mouthing what I interpret as, put your foot on the brake and put the car in gear, which seems passing strange because that's what I'm already doing anyhow. But the pleasant young man keeps on gesturing and shouting until finally I roll the window down halfway for the purpose of telling him to stop mumbling, for Christ's sakes, and here instead, take your foot off the brake and take the car out of gear. <laughs> As any competent audiologist can tell you, put and take sound remarkably alike un <laughs> under certain atmospheric conditions. But before I can sort out and obey, the, obey these apparently contradictory instructions, the car lurches forward. Lurch is going to be the operative word from here on. And I see to my horror that rushing toward me is this great hideous spongy pink alien thing with long flabby tentacles slapping at my fenders, my hood, my windshield. And now these vile slimy pink tendrils are actually inside the car. <laughs> <laughs> Flippity, flippity, flappity, flopping through the, through the still half open window, invading my personal space and flinging nasty car wash juices all over me. And my glasses and my nice upholstery and my nice new goat suede jacket. And, and I'm frantically trying to take them back out with one hand to poke them back out with one hand while fumbling, fumbling at the electric window, window button with the other. But the more tentacles I push out, the more come flapping in behind them. The car lurches again, lurch, lurch, lurch. I still have my foot on the brake and the car is still in gear, but I'm far too busy to deal with that right now. <laughs> my, fa 
my finger finds, finds the button and the window goes up and closes on several limp, flabby, sopping tentacles. I lower it to fling them out, whereupon the terrible pink alien instantly expels a jet of hot, soapy venom that strikes me right between the eyes. Rush, Lim Rush Limbaugh calls me a contemptible, limp-wristed limp liberal and chortles insanely. Lurch, lurch. I finally get the last tentacle out and the window rolled up and lunge for the gear shift to yank it out of drive, but in my haste almost succeed in slamming it into reverse instead. Cleave gnashes his metallic teeth alarmingly. Together, Cleave and I slip the ardent embrace of the rapacious extraterrestrial ro rotating giant pink squid and with rush fulminating volcanically about milksop liberals, we lurch, lurch, lurch into the drying phase so that now we are buffeted by to ro roaring tornadic blasts of hot air both without and within. I go for the volume knob and imagining that I have rush by his odious nose twisted viciously <laughs> leftward and then... And then it is as though a brief but terrible storm has passed. Rush abruptly hushes his odious mouth, and the dark car wash grotto where lurks the loathsome pink shelob is somehow behind us, and Cleve and I are outside on the tarmac in the sunny afternoon, and the pleasant young man is tap, tap, tapping at my window. After a quick glance at the rearview mirror to make sure the monster hasn't followed us out, I roll the window down. Next time, sir, the pleasant young man advises me, put the car out of gear and ride, I assure him brightly, tapping the acceler accelerator in my eagerness to be elsewhere, any goddamn elsewhere, ASAP, absolutely, yes indeed, you bet, and take your foot off the but Cleve and I are already making tracks, beating it, skedaddling for the barn. Giddy up, Cleve. At home, when I breathlessly recount my ordeal to the madam, she is utterly unsympathetic and blames the whole thing on me. Me, of all people, for being such a horse's ass on the subject of hearing aids. She doesn't actually say horse's ass, of course, but I dare say we horse's asses can read between the lines <laughs> as well as the next fellow. Undaunted, I stick to my principles. No doubt, no dice, I snort disdainfully. I hate those ugly little plastic wads that make a person look like he's parked his chewing gum in his ear. I'll get a hearing aid, I tell her, when they make a big red one. That's a ticket, designer hearing aids. Why the hell not? They make designer eyeglasses, don't they? I demand a hearing aid shaped like a pig's ear. <laughs> but, but the madam, who is a Central European, and therefore not as advanced as we are, <laughs> has heard all this before, and she is not impressed by my philosophy. Sweetheart, she coos as I stalk off to lick my wounds and brush the water spots off my goat suede jacket. You are such a dummy sometimes. <laughs> and at this convenient impasse, our story ends, except that I promised an update on Cleve's condition. After that treacherous ant, a goddamn water maple, wouldn't you know, parted his hair and tried to make a dune buggy of him. Well, all of you who have joined me in praying for his recovery will be happy to learn that a few minutes ago, Dr. Panelbeater called from the body shop to tell me it looks like Cleve is going to be okay. At least I think that's what he said. <laughs> the, way, the way some people mumble, some mumble nowadays, there's just no telling. <laughs> Thank you. Happy Saturday. Glad we're seeing the sun today, too. <clears throat> um, since we have uh, the right kind of people here, I can tell you about this. Um, uh, Kentucky writer Eric Reese um, 
two years ago began an organization called Kentucky Writers and Artists for Reforestation. And it's a wonderful program. It's a, a way to do positive good where the, the goal of the group is to plant hardwood trees on abandoned strip mine sites um, in partnership with an organization called Green Forests Work, which is based in Lexington. And um, last fall, we had uh, an event called 800 Acorns, where we went down into Pulaski County and planted 800 acorns. Marianne was, <laughs> Marianne planted one. And um, afterwards, um, when we were driving away, I drove by a little cemetery and sitting in the woods and uh, all of my mother's ancestors are buried there. And I, we were just 150 yards from this cemetery. Um, so um, this is called Planting Trees in God's Country. My people sought down, they say, 200 years before the beginning of time, being kicked out of the place where they had been, never to prosper there, only to toil. And here in deep woods and on hills steep and rugged and rocky, they made a hill farm, not to prosper, but in quiet hope to survive, to plant in the ground and feed themselves. And that meant clearing a patch of land, cutting the trees, breaking the dark original canopy in violence to let the sunlight reach the ground, all for a little corn and beans, surrounded by the first beauty. If this was done unthinkingly, without a measure of regret, I do not know. I have my thoughts. We have to live with ignorance, even painfully our own. We also have to imagine the past and believe we come from it, not to undo it, but simply to imagine and therefore belong by opening the ground. And then imagine shade in summer coming to this place again and birdsong in the branches of heaven-reaching trees, living ladders stuck in the ground to give the future another rung of its past. The invitation is to climb. One thing I know about God's country, it's everywhere and all there is. I'm sure you all are familiar with the number 10 wash tub galvanized, it's the big one. <clears throat> this is called, I've got those mean old number 10 wash tub blues. <laughs> Everything is a metaphor, even the bent over heads of grass that's gone to seed and the sway they make and the rhythm of the swaying, devoted little emblems of green. Sometimes I turn the wash tub over when I think a rain is coming in to let the rain thump the bottom of the tub, a nice, low, sleepy sound, depending on the rain. I enjoy that kind of truth. The daydream wanders into the light. More often, however, the wash tub only hangs by its handle from a nail in the barn, and the tub is mute except when it catches from the distance the old man farther down the way calling his cows home for the night with the high-pitched whoo and whoop and the open tub cradles his voice and lulls it lightly back as if a hymn is being sounded out. It isn't despair I hear in his voice, but I like to hear the lonely in it and how the wash tub makes it ring. An old man's voice in a wash tub, a daydream making its way to the light. Very particular instruments, 
We might as well add a spice bush to the scene and work it into the low refrain, the thumping low refrain, depending on the ringing rain. Two more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, three old mountain women. They were country beauties in their time, but I knew them when they were old, wearing straight dark dresses below the knee, absolved of passion, what little there had been, because the women I'm thinking of, my kin, were practical, mothers of children, the rearing, the little patch of land, and their continuance, what they were born to, a hard place, a people. Above all, they were gardeners, green down to their being roots, and roots in the spreading ground below their calm countenance, when sitting in a straight-backed chair, a voice prompted them to tell a tale, and then they told it plainly, aware I sometimes thought of what effect hearing the tale would have on me. But now I think I merely needed a voice, a voice suspended in the air. Well, I declare, and together they gave it to me. We have a three-year-old at home. Uh, the little one's welcome to stay. Uh, we have a three-year-old at home, and uh, she's talking pretty well now, but for a while, one of her favorite words was yin yin. <laughs> and I'll explain, I'll translate that. And <laughs> this is called the Gospel of Music. You have to thank the great beyond if your child delights in bird song, especially a chorus of it, a dizzy crowd of birds singing, warbles, chits, and caws ringing through the sanctuary of the woods. Although I heard the birds myself, it was the little one who pointed her finger to the budding trees and pronounced the word she has for music, composed of a pair of syllables, both beginning vaguely with Y, with emphasis rightly on the first. It happens also to be the word she has for donkey and the plural of donkey. And it's also the word she says regarding the photograph of an old time banjo player she sees at supper time. She sees the sound of a silent instrument and that's the true gospel of music. In the beginning was the word and the word was music and birds and donkeys and God was a serious banjo player with an inscrutable face who said to everything alive, I made the world for singing. Now you sing. Thank you. Wow. This is a good crowd here. Um, can you hear me if I got the mic in the right place? Well, in call and response to Morris's um, talk, I want to read this one poem, The Mountain's Tree. Birds flew from the tree when the tree fell. Birds circled for hours trying to find their nests in the empty air. The great root stood up like a house before the steel blade. First they pushed the tree into the valley. Then they pushed the mountain onto the tree that was on the mountain. Where did the raccoon and the fox go when the mountain began its crashing down, when the mountain buried the tree? There were foxes on the mountain and foxes where the mountain fell. Where is the path that the boy made by going to the tree because it was the biggest on the mountain and sometimes he sat under it being quiet or sometimes he could climb it 
because the thick limbs let him. He could get way up. He could see everything. The terrible noise came when the steel took the, took the tree out of the mountain. He heard it from way down the slope. He ran and ran, but the steel had already sent the tree over the edge, and now it was sending the mountain down on top of the tree. And why? And why? Because. And now, where the tree was, up there in the sky, and he could see it from way far away, there is no tree. And where the mountain was, there is no mountain. Um, the book that I'm reading from is a book of new and selected poems, many of which appeared first in a book called Dividing Ridge that Gray and Larkspur uh, published, and Leslie. Um, and um, I'm, um, I, I love that book. It had beautiful uh, drawings by Arwen Donahue in it. And it is, it, 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 it's contained in, it, a lot of it is contained in this book. But uh, then there are other poems as well. To the muse, come to me, my other, my orphan, my one and only spirit cloud, my own angel. Come through this fort of bone, this crush of person, Come through, find form, live here, be alive with me. What comes then is a black lab, head on my thigh, drooling creek water, wanting, wanting. Finally he goes to lie in his spot by the stove, smelling of distant skunk, licking his privates. Oh well, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a this event is so wonderfully put together I'm very very grateful to to Virginia and Mary and all of the staff for making this possible every year God of the galaxies and there was light now here we are only we don't know where we are in the midst of all the unimaginable dark out there-ness, the thick of it, the thin of it, the, brilliant, the billions of galaxies, dark energy, dark matter, all that secretiveness and explosive mystery. Nowhere whistles through the air a galactic wind now here, our fragile defense against the milky vastness, the timeless, personless dark. We caught the light. Wherever we are, here we are. We came into our speeding moment, our flake of time. Here we are. We call it Earth, the movement, the moment, the rain coming, passing, gone the blue-gray violets, the wild geese honking up off the pond, and all the bloody, holy rest of it. Stay. Plaintive and desperate, the coyotes tonight are begging the moon the whole round, solemn, perfect fact of it, to stay, to stay right there, high over the hill. It does not stay. Before any mouth or breath, in the first great flood of emptiness, already the moon was drifting up through stars and flying clouds, then falling out of sight at the western edge Already the moon was turning in and out of Earth's shadow, Earth's darkened sky, the moon's great stage. There was no audience. But then, silent ages later, in darkness and light, 
things began to move, to hiss and grunt and roar. And before we came to what we now call words, some creature must have noticed where the moon came up and set and how it crept along the east and west horizons a little further to the north or south each day till reaching a certain point, it turned and started back the other way, a noticing that took in more than now, a first remembering and so a first prediction. Our slow pendulum, the tick and talk of time began, rising, falling, waxing, waning, losing, gaining. Many moons ago, we said, when finally we said anything, eternal turning, returning, as the earth turns around the sun, we came to know the moon is bound to the deep core of our earth. Its looping orbit is only its desire to fly off free. We've harnessed something wild, but it cannot escape earth any more than earth can escape the sun. These grave attachments. Even now, when we've been there, planted our flag and scraped up samples of its soil to study, even now, such mystery. O oh, moon, you have your strong force too. You rule earth's tides and pull life up out of its seed. You rule earth's creatures as earth rules you. We have you and then lose you over and over. In your fullness, our mares foal, our women bleed, our witches dance, our murderers feel their need like sex. The doors of Bedlam fly open, let loose their lunatics. Sleep slinks away. Oh, how like the coyotes for the moon up there above the winter hill in its perfect moment of illumination. It lasts only an instant before the shadow of our earth begins again to take her light away. I'll read one more. Since this is the falling back week, this is a poem called Falling Back. This is the day of falling back. I'm wandering ankle deep through fallen oak leaves till the slanted light falls and then night falls out of nowhere. I fall asleep. I dream an old lover wants to help me cross the street. At 4 a.m., the earthbound planes start falling slowly through the net of branches. Maybe they're heading toward New York. Do you remember? A dark wing fans the air around me into light again, crows in the wind against pink fog. I'm writing this in my plan book. I haven't had a plan since October 8th. I guess I'm losing hold. Sometimes my life seems like a glint of brightness falling through fog. Then memory lifts, disperses, leaving the sharp-edged only world timeless. Here is the hour I've gained, accept it in kindness, as a kind of kindness, as grace, as grace, a threshold, a crossing, not losing hold, not falling, holding, holding still. I'll read this one last poem. The Great Oak on the Ridge. High up, the ornate ceremony of disappearance is nearly complete. A small final glow, not yet let go of, lifted toward the sky. But it's the stalwart form of the tree's revealed shape that takes the stark, long shadow casting light this afternoon, my own thin shadow stilled on a ridge of rock beside it. Here, for this instant, has no name. Then earth breaks through the chorus of many things, the tall blowing winter weeds, 
the long clouds moving sideways across the west, one crow headed homeward, and myself in my old tan jacket and scuffed up boots, turning and going on. Thank you very much. I, I see this uh, wonderful event becoming a tradition. This is a, uh, I was here last year, and um, one clue that it's a tradition already is that I discovered in a little booklet over at the bookstore across the street, <clears throat> there's a booklet um, portraying last year with photographs. And I wore the exact same outfit. <laughs> Head to toe, head to toe, beret. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'll be here next year. <laughs> um, first, I want to read you a little three paragraph thing I call flash fiction. And it's in that patchwork book that um, was mentioned. And this is called Corn Dog with a hyphen, Corn Dog. Um, <clears throat> here he is, unmarried, fat, with few cravings, stuck in a stucco house, waiting for parcels to arrive by UPS, waiting for anything to come out of the blue. Anything would be welcome. Bill collectors, laryngitis, UFOs, but a letter from Laura would be nice. He really wants nothing else. On the sidewalk, a neighbor walks her mutt, which resembles a carnival corn dog. He saw a dog like that on Animal Planet. The necks of the neighbor and her corn dog stretch similarly toward their mutual goal, the curb. She, she wears creased shorts that end just above her less than thrilling knees. Her hair is wispy, frothy, like something from a French bakery. The disgruntled old guy with asthma struts by with his fuzzy standard poodle. He imagines this old guy with a whiny wife who tries to make him eat goat cheese and arugula. The old guy must sing hallelujah when he is out the door with the standard poodle. They march down the sidewalk, ready to spank any corn dog that crosses their path. A wasp has sneaked into the stucco house. Trying to shoo it away, he is stung between two digits, and a welt arises. Trying to shoo it away, he is stung between two digits, and a welt arises. He doesn't flinch. He stares at the sting stoically. He is stoic in his stucco house. Since Laura left, he feels nothing but her absence. Yet now he searches for some sticky gunk to soothe his finger, for the wasp sting is not fake. It is a true wasp sting, and he feels it. The salve on his finger is like mustard spreading on a light, crispy crust. That's and, and now for something completely different. I have a prop. Um, I thought in that um, we should bring some joy to um, our uh, season of angst we've been feeling lately. Uh, let's see. We've been feeling like this. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I, this is an old piece that I wrote in 1994. It was in the Shouts and Murmurs column of the New Yorker. And um, it's, it was on the occasion of the Scream painting by Edvard Munch being stolen from the uh, museum in Norway. And um, there was an obvious connection to 
the subject of this little story called All Shook Up. Scream sightings have been popping up all over the place ever since the famous Munk painting was stolen from the National Art Museum in Norway. The scream was first spotted at the Olympics and then at a Starbucks in Santa Barbara. It was glimpsed on a frozen shoulder of I-95 just south of Waterville, Maine, trying to hitch a ride, and it turned up on, on the same morning in the crowd beside the batting cage in Sarasota, where Michael Jordan was making his first swings of the day. It has been seen driving a big rig, walking a Rottweiler, and lurking around mini-marts, laundromats, and factory outlets. But these are all bogus reports. I know where the scream really is. It's right here in front of me, in my kitchen. How the universal totem of complaint materialized at my house in the heartland is a good question. I had already been screaming a lot over assorted recent tribulations, ruckus on the Richter scale, Tanya Harding's bodyguard, Oliver North's olive drab hat flying into the ring, Lilyhammer-like winter weather everywhere, the Kavanaugh hearings, <laughs> <laughs> and a friend who has one of those inflatable four-foot screams tethered in her dining room sent me an eight-inch scream junior of my very own. My husband, Roger, blew it up and set it on a paddle of the ceiling fan. It looked terrified. He put it on the floor where the cats gave it a good sniffing over and the scream looked as if it were holding its breath in expectation of a fatal puncture. Then Roger placed, placed the scream in the arms of our life-size plush Coco the gorilla, nothing doing. Everywhere he put it was worse than the last from the scream's timid looking perspective. Then something happened. Roger set the scream in front of our Elvis. More than one vanished icon has found a new place to dwell here, but I can't get, go into that. Our Elvis, a sexy ceramic collectible, entertains on top of a cabinet between the sun space and the stairs. He's decked out in one of his caped Aztec sun god suits, which is missing a few sequins. There in the light, he really appears to be a sun god, or at least one of the sun god's buddies. I like to think of him as Orpheus, the original rockabilly who plucked the lyre in a band with Apollo, Hermes, and big boss man Pan. They say Orpheus could charm rocks, but Elvis could charm the pants off a snake. Now, the king of rock and roll and the official spokesperson of angst stand face to face, their mouths hanging open. It is as if they were meeting down at the end of Lonely Street, one block over from Valhalla. Their confrontation is timeless, yet full of moment. Eee, says the scream. It shakes Elvis up. What is this? The scream looks about 100 years old and is as bald as a monk. Bless my soul, what's wrong with me, Elvis wonders. He starts itching like a man on a fuzzy tree. <laughs> He's acting white as a bug. His insides are shaking like a leaf on a tree. You ain't nothing but a hound dog, Elvis cajoles, trying to shush the scream, crying all the time. He croons, are you lonesome tonight? Eee, says the scream. Hey, baby, Elvis says. I ain't asking much of you. No, 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 no. Don't be a stingy little mama. You about starved me half to death. Just a big, a big, a big a hunk of love will do. The scream is fixing to scream again. So Elvis tries a different hack. He says, Bugsy turned to Shifty and he said, nix, nix. Elvis's knees begin to roll. Then his pelvis begins its customary swivel, his left leg working like a bit brace. Everybody let's rock, he cries. Slowly, the scream begins to undulate. 
Its lips are like a volcano when it's hot. It feels its temperature rising higher and higher, burning through to its soul. Its brain is flaming. It doesn't know which way to go. It's burning, burning, and nothing to cool it. It just might turn to smoke. The flames are now licking its body. It feels like it's slipping away. It's hard to breathe. Its chest is a haven. Its burning love is lighting the morning skies. It's just a hunk a hunk of burning love. The scream reaches for the scarf around the king's neck. Eee, it says. I'm proud to say that you're my buttercup, Elvis gasps. I am smiling. If rock and roll will never die, can spring be far behind? <laughs> Thank you.